away from Houston, Texas, Dr. Lisa Spire. Thanks so much. Uh, it's a real thrill to be here and to hear about all the exciting work that's uh, starting up around digital humanities. So what I want to talk about today is the impact of digital humanities on teaching and learning. This is a subject that I'm quite passionate about. And I think that passion emerges in part from my personal history. So I'm going to confess to having a few gray hairs. Uh, and I, I got started doing my uh, work in the humanities uh, in the, the 90s. So some of you may recall with me uh, what it was like to do work in the humanities in the early 90s when uh, doing research really meant working with, with books and periodicals. Remember those, those green uh, reader's guides to periodical uh, literature? Um, whereas now, of course, researchers have access to a, a wealth of information. So digital archives focusing on uh, Walt Whitman or classics or a range of other topics. And indeed, students can actually help to create archives and editorial projects uh, in collaboration with others. There are also um, new possibilities for how we uh, conduct critical analysis. So back in the 90s, my primary tool for doing critical analysis was a highlighter, not to diss the highlighter, uh, but you know, now we have access to uh, powerful tools for conducting textual analysis, and I'll give a couple examples of, of those sorts of tools, as well as for transforming data into to pictures uh, and, and conducting visualization and using those visualizations to prompt new insights. In terms of communicating ideas, um, you know, I, I was basically writing for an audience of one, uh, turning in my, my papers. But now, of course, there are new um, enriched possibilities for reaching a larger audience and presenting ideas in, in a variety of formats. Uh, videos, blogs in which you can have ongoing dialogue, uh, 3D models, publications that incorporate different forms of media. So, um, what I'd like to start with is actually inviting input from you all. I, I don't want this to be a sort of one-way monologue. I hope to stimulate some dialogue. And I, I'm, I'm really impressed by the diversity of people in the room, uh, different perspectives. So I want you to think about this question. What are three things that you think students need to know in the digital age? I mean, I, I articulated these sort of advantages of the digital age, but I would, would suggest that there are also real challenges. How do you deal with the sort of avalanche of information? Uh, how do you use tools in a way that uh, is, is critical, that you're not just working with a black box, you're aware of the limitations of these tools? How do you reach an audience and understand how to interact with that audience? So take just a minute to think about this question. What, what do people need to know? What do students need to know um, in this sort of digital environment? And, and I'll ask for you to, to shout out ideas in just a minute. while I take a drink of water. So what do you think? What are some things that, that students need to know? Yeah. Well, I'm from history, and I know one thing that's really interesting is we have research collections that take us into archives. Uh -huh. But students don't necessarily distinguish that from getting one primary source that someone's posted on a blog or a page. So how do you distinguish like a research guide that actually lets them go to a whole body of research versus just one piece of evidence that's been randomly selected? That's a really good question. Yeah, so, so is it the sense that this, this um, is kind of decontextualized or, or that exactly. people are accessing information so rapidly that they're not fully processing it? Yeah, and they, there's not the comparative, like, here are 10 documents related to something. Like, they, they're just going for that one, not realizing it comes from a body of 10 that could be found if you go to the research guide. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, yeah. Taking that on a broader scale, uh, some students have trouble telling a good, reliable online source from something that is perhaps a little bit less scholarly. Uh huh. Yeah. So, how do you uh, determine how authoritative information is? Um, go beyond the wiki. 
go beyond the wiki. Go beyond the wiki. I think I have students that you know they feel if they've read, you know, excerpts uh -huh. <laughs> somehow that they've really accessed that right. resource. Right. So you need deeper reading. Yeah, like read more. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> I'm interested in hearing from yeah. Uh, since, this, since there is such an abundance of sources, I think it's important when we're doing research to recognize that <clears throat> no project or work is ever going to be complete. Yeah, you have to kind of embrace the, <laughs> the fact that you're not going to know it all. <clears throat> That's okay. Oh. Um, what else? Yeah language that when we're building this new wonder world of research materials that we um, make sure that they can be translated to multiple places where it's a, UTSA is a Hispanic serving institution, has a large population and you know, particularly family large population of people who may have, you know, particularly Spanish but many other languages as a primary language and a lot of digital tools are English only and aren't, tra you know, aren't translated the way you know, canonical major resources are. So trying to make sure that when we build it, we actually build it and allow more people to use them. Yeah, this is something we're struggling with in the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations. It's an international organization, but how do you reach such a diverse linguistic community? Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I think, a pretty common challenge. Maybe something else. Students need to know that not everything is on the internet. Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's not the total body of knowledge. Right, yes. And, and yeah, you're limiting yourself if you assume that it is. Students need some search engine literacy to understand that the algorithm is not necessarily bringing them on the first page to the best uh, get some of the highest quality information. Yeah. And, and yeah, and understand how these search engines work uh, based on you know where you are and who you are. And, and how you're constructing your searches. And how much the websites are paid. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. How to preserve not just the artifacts we're working with, but also the artifacts that we're creating. Hmm. Can, can you say more about that? Well, I'm just thinking of how much is being created that's completely digital. Uh -huh. um, Right, yeah, I mean, that's a huge challenge, the, the challenge of, of digital preservation. So. Just to tag on that, there's visual cues. They need to know the visual cues of and in visual communication. We talk about what are some of the cues that are in the digital realm that really up the integrity of a resource. You know, um, a well-archived SEO design site is mm -hmm. a good indication that it might be a valid source. Yeah. So I want to flip this question, because I, I know we have some students in the room. What do faculty need to know? <laughs> that we like we're reading Wikipedia. You like reading? <laughs> that, that we like reading Wikipedia. Okay. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> well, just because um, very few places are as curated. Well, they're, it's not curated in the traditional sense, but it's user curated rather than, shall we say, expert curated. So it's, it is a curated site in so much as the users that um, make sure that the information is accurate, but that doesn't necessarily imply that the information itself isn't as valuable. Mm -hmm. I agree that the extended links are certainly more valuable than the wiki itself, but it's, um, there are very few places that are as valuable for, shall we say, a roadmap as sites like Wikipedia are. Mm -hmm. So anything that, anything that purports to act like a, digital, like a digital humanities roadmap will probably benefit from structuring itself like a wiki or something like it. So yeah, I mean I used to be a Wikipedia campus ambassador and, and was like you know stunned by the sort of governance model that's involved in Wikipedia, the ways in which uh, a, a sort of review process happens, a really intensive review process. And, and just the you know if you look at the edit history and yeah, I mean and the ways that different conflicts are negotiated, it's Fascinating. There are fights, like yeah. literal fights that happen in the in the change log. That's just that's awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you how you though deal? Because there is still a stigma in scholarship that you know you can you should never source that, or you know it should be like you said a beginning of a of a journey, but um, it still doesn't get the props. <laughs> and I think there was a study when it celebrated ten years a couple years ago. Um, there was an article about that it actually 
has fewer mistakes than our old printed Britannicas. Right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's more sort of current and but there's still this is kind of integrity that it's not, you know, it's not for the real scholar or something. Well, I mean, it raises all sorts of issues about expertise. Um, I, I actually wrote a blog post, oh gosh, this is probably seven years ago, looking at um, to the extent to which academics were citing Wikipedia, and was actually surprised that there are a fair number of people who are citing it for various reasons. Uh, like my, my uh, colleague, Matt Kirschenbaum, was citing it, as I recall, um, in describing some aspects of software and software culture, because that's you know a really up to date source for that kind of information. Um, but yeah, I mean I think we could have a whole discussion about the nature of expertise just using Wikipedia as our example. Um, I was also impressed at this Wikipedia uh, conference that I attended at just the passion of students who were involved in writing for, for Wikipedia and editing Wikipedia entries. I mean, that, that really gets you thinking critically about how you convey knowledge, how you source your, uh, you know, your claims, because uh, there, there are pretty high standards uh, for, for verifying or validating your sources. So. Anything else students want that they think faculty should, should know? Yeah. <coughs> So are, are there things you, like you wish uh, the faculty would expose you more to? Or, or like what's, what's the base knowledge that you, you would build upon? Like by the time you get to college, you probably know how to build a presentation. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need to expand on what you can do with that, but that base knowledge is probably there. there. Mm -hmm. One struggle I face is just the, the, the sort of variation in levels of, of technical knowledge. Like some people are really adept and others need more help. Uh, yeah. Um, I think it's very frustrating that I think some professors expect us to like sit in the library and open like 20 books to find the information. Um, coming from a generation that has like stuff handed to them pretty quickly because of technology, um, it's just Where they don't have as much time. Uh -huh. so, yeah, so, so if you can get it quickly. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, I mean, so do you think there is any kind of advantage to sort of slowness uh, in, in terms of doing research? Well, um, it, just in kind of forcing you to pay attention to something in a singular way for an extended period of time? Or? What I mean is, like, um, so you know, you can have a search bar, like, to search specific words throughout the journal, and it'll take you to the source. Uh-huh. Because um, I heard, I guess, somebody say you do something besides the internet. Um, mm -hmm. So the first thing I thought of was, like, in the library, the books, uh, journals, articles. Um, but it's very frustrating. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And yeah, there's a lot of power to being able to just kind of go straight to the, the term that you're looking for. Yeah? I, the advantage in slowness, as you put it, the, the thing that I see in it is that if you are, it depends on what the end result of the assignment is, quote-unquote. Mm -hmm. if, if it's to get a finished product, then speed is, of, speed is of the essence. But if the point is pedagogy and to impose upon the student or to inflict upon the student <laughs> A, 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 an article or an item of learning, then slowness is of the essence because then it gives them more opportunity to uptake 
what it is, the concept that you want to instill to instill within them. So I'm I consider myself to be relatively digitally adept, but there is there is nothing in my mind more valuable than hard copy. Mm. I I love books. <laughs> so I, I don't know. And probably it is a cultural thing because I think we do have a generation that have not they don't have those same skills of the slowness. Their only skill set is of the, the speed of, of research uh -huh. in the digital age. I think that there's an advantage to one thing that's often lost by getting your information in a big hurry and having it handed, it, handed to you by a search engine is you lose the value of exploration. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in a library and you're looking for a book, you look for a particular book even, and you say, oh, you're not there yet, but here's a book that looks kind of interesting. Let me pull off, off the shelf and see what, what's there. And you can find other things, even if you're flipping through a journal looking for a specific article, you may find other articles in that issue that maybe they have to do with your paper, maybe they don't, maybe they're just interesting to you. So that you're exploring things. Of course, you can do that digitally too, <coughs> if you are willing to take the time to say, okay, I found what I need, but now I've got a little bit of time on my hands, let's I love Wikipedia. You go there, you read about something, and something catches your attention, you hyperlink over to the next one, and the next one, next time, then you know you're a completely different subject. It has nothing to do with your paper. <laughs> but it, that's the value of exploration. Serendipity. Yeah. A couple more comments. Uh, uh, I, want, I want to thank you for being so honest about your experience, uh, especially with the library. Uh, I think a lot of us, especially who are, let's say, a little bit past the digital don't understand how natural it is to not look through books. One of the things that, that I realized a few years ago when I teach free students when I went through a textbook and they were telling me I cannot find the meaning of these words. And I said, have you looked in the glossary? Right? Mm -hmm. And I made a joke about you can't just press the word. <laughs> right? But one of the things that falls on us as a critical responsibility <coughs> is showing students that there's, there are deeper levels of information available and going through some of the solar processes, I think, can help students understand that you have to be critical about the process. Um, and part of the problem with a lot of digital media search engines um, is that they're geared to give you the immediate gratification. Right? But too often, um, it's not you know, the deepest message, and it's more often you know, a corporate commodified message. Um, and so like, I take very seriously you know, that responsibility of saying, look, let's look at these uh, various research options. And how can we move from one paradigm to another and then apply the skills we've learned from both? Um, so, you know, um, the one hand and the other. I think uh, maybe what I said is kind of misunderstood. Um, so, you have a book, you can find it in the library, but you can also find it online. So, if you, like, I'm writing an argument paper right now, um, it was a lot easier to find an image online source and read it, and I was interested in it, uh, but then as opposed to going into the library and finding the book and having to search for the image through the book, mm -hmm. that's what, that was my purpose, not I'm trying to break into the paper, but it's just more interesting when I see the image and I can go straight to it. Mm -hmm. sure. So it's a greater efficiency. Right. Yeah. Well, th this has been a really rich conversation. Um, what I, I hope to kind of focus on projects that are more about sort of producing rather than consuming knowledge uh, and, and um, that sort of evoke these sort of critical ways of looking at information. Uh, so uh, I would argue that digital humanities can be one approach to cultivating these sort of important ways of thinking in the digital age. Uh, and there's been a lot of attention over the last few years paid to the potential for digital humanities in the undergraduate classroom. So an article in uh, the New York Times a couple of years ago, for example, looked at the ways that students at Bryn Mawr were using um, a virtual reality to explore what it was like to produce Shakespearean plays. Or a recent article in the Chronicle of Higher Education looked at the digital humanities certificate program at UCLA and the ways in which students were developing uh, important skills in thinking about data and representing data. Um, so before I go too much further, I want to define this really fuzzy term, digital humanities. 
And, you know, there are probably about as many definitions of the term as there are people who think of themselves as digital humanists, maybe even more. Uh, but I like the definition uh, put forward by Kathleen Fitzpatrick, who talks about the ways in which digital humanities is, is an interdiscipline. Um, so it brings together different fields. It's a point of connection. Um, and it, it's both about uh, using technology to ask humanities questions and asking humanities questions of technology. So we'll look at some examples of digital humanities in action to try to make this a little more concrete. So here's the, the basic outline of where I'm going with this talk. Uh, first of all, I want to sort of dive into this question a little bit more about what's important to know in the digital age. Then I want to um, kind of expand on that by looking at a few examples of, uh, I think, effective uses of digital humanities in the classroom uh, and other learning situations. And, and then I want to kind of point to some obstacles and suggest ways to address these obstacles. So, first of all, this, this, let's go further with this question of what students need to know. Uh, and I would sort of invoke these principles of, of liberal education in thinking about um, this sort of core knowledge and ways of thinking, this importance of, of being adaptable and flexible in responding to new kinds of uh, information and, and new kinds of uh, research challenges, uh, being able to apply uh, analytical skills, uh, in a real-world context, uh, and being able to communicate uh, the results of your work. So using that as a touchstone, we can think about specific uh, literacies that are important in a digital context. And this is something that, that Kathy Davidson has talked about in her book, uh, Now You See It. She points to a number of different digital literacies, but I'll just highlight a few including attention. So, I mean, this kind of gets to the point about slowness, about knowing where to focus your attention and where not to focus your attention, where it makes sense to be faster. Uh, asking critical questions of uh, the information that you deal with, something we've already discussed. Being able to learn new skills, to adapt to new kinds of situations. Uh, being able to, to put the information uh, that you uh, are examining into a context, to, to, give, uh, to tell a story about it. Um, or to uh, design effective ways to present it in a sort of visual framework or other kind of framework. And also the ability to, to work with people from a variety of perspectives to produce new knowledge. Uh, I'd also sort of think about the, the ways in which uh, education in part is about cultivating expertise. And I like uh, John C. Lee Brown's formulation of this. It's about <laughs> moving from learning about, so like learning about medicine, for example, to learning to, to be, how to be a part of a community of people, of, of practitioners, how to, to actually uh, do the surgery. Uh, one reason why I'm interested in this topic of what is expertise is I, I recently uh, completed a study with uh, several colleagues that asked uh, the question, what constitutes expertise in digital scholarship? And the way we examined this question is, this is going to sound pretty good. Uh, we uh, looked at uh, people who are practitioners in digital scholarship in digital scholarship organizations around the world, in China, uh, Mexico, India, Germany, the United Kingdom, Canada, and the United States. And you would expect with such a wide array of different locations, there would be a lot of variation in the kinds of um, skills, competencies, mindsets that were um, really important, but we did find some common elements of expertise that I think actually would apply beyond the, the realm of digital scholarship. One important element was just the ability to work on teams. So the nature of much work in digital humanities is profoundly collaborative, so that you bring together um, a, a, a scholar who has expertise in, say, 18th century literature with a scholar uh, who has expertise in computer science, and together they devise a way to um, construct an algorithm to detect metaphor in literature, for example, and in the process learn a lot about each other's area of expertise. Uh, it's also really important to have a sort of learning mindset, so you're confronting these new challenges, you're inventing new ways of, of working through research problems. You have to have a passion for that, curiosity, 
And this was something that was manifest in the people we interviewed. Uh, some degree of domain knowledge was important, depending on your role within a project. Uh, the people on a team had to sort of understand the research questions that were being asked uh, and kind of come up with ways of addressing those questions. Uh, they also needed to understand the core methodologies. So for social scientists, for example, it was important for, for people to understand the ethics involved in asking questions of social science data, uh, as well as you know, uh, how to properly apply statistical methods. Of course, technical, school, technical skills were important, depending on the nature of the work. That could be skills in GIS, it could be skills in um, database design. Programming was pretty universal. And finally, the ability to make things happen, to, to manage projects effectively. Uh, so it's not that we're trying to train students to become digital scholars. That's, that's not necessarily the point. But I think it's, it's helpful to think about uh, the elements of expertise that are sort of suggested with this framework. Now, all this talk about skills makes my own skin crawl a little bit because, of course, there, there's an importance in just cultivating a sense of wonder. Uh, and I think uh, in, in our classroom, uh, we're about inciting passion for a subject, not just about teaching particular skills. So I don't want to lose sight of that. And I hope to present some examples of ways that digital humanities assignments have stimulated that sense of wonder and passion. So uh, my interest in this, su this subject also uh, was driven by work I did several years ago looking at a collection of about 130 different syllabi from digital humanities classes, kind of broadly construed. Uh, and th there were some, even though there was, of course, significant variation among these syllabi, there was also uh, some uh, common factors, uh, including uh, an emphasis on student projects. Those projects might include creating a video or uh, creating some sort of digital collection. Um, often these projects were collaborative in nature. Uh, they asked students to, to kind of link together theory and practice. So you might ask theoretical questions about what constitutes an archive and what choices are made in putting it together, what's excluded. But you would also sort of um, explore that in a really embedded way through the act of working together to construct such an archive. Uh, there's often a, a, a sort of public component as well. Uh, so using blogs, for example, to build a community across the class and beyond. And indeed, these are common elements I found in, in digital pedagogy, uh, which uh, that camp liberal arts, a gathering of people with a sort of passion for digital pedagogy, defined as the engaged and reflexive practice and scholarship of teaching and learning uh, through digital technology. So, so I would emphasize the engaged and reflexive. It's not just about using technology for technology's sake. It's about having really clear learning objectives as part of that. Um, and uh, often you find with uh, digital pedagogy an emphasis on play and experimentation, um, which can in part be empowered by the use of digital tools. Uh, but also this aim to, to get people thinking critically about how these tools and resources are being used. Um, so, so there's this kind of profound desire for critical understanding. So now I'd like to get more specific and talk uh, about some examples I find inspiring of, of ways that uh, instructors have brought digital methods into uh, the classroom and other learning contexts. And I'll articulate three features of uh, digital pedagogy uh, that often, as I said before, uh, these, these learning experiences are project driven, that they're playful and they're social in nature. Now, in terms of project driven, of course, this is not just a feature of digital humanities. Uh, many uh, courses and learning experiences include a project component. Um, and, and there's even a sort of a, a framework for thinking about project driven learning. Uh, which includes having a sort of open-ended question that motivates the learning, uh, that uh, then leads to a sort of desire, need to, to know, to, to conduct the research, the experimentation, to figure things out, to ask further questions. Uh, but students have freedom in exploring these questions, but also have the opportunity to receive feedback uh, and to produce a sort of public product, an authentic 
product that has impact in, in the world. So one of my favorite examples of uh, a sort of project-driven approach uh, it comes from the classics community. I know we have a, a couple of classicists here. I'm an Americanist, so you, you can kind of help me fill in the details here. Um, but uh, Chris Blackwell and, and Thomas Martin sort of are, articulate the advantage of having meaningful, real undergraduate research where students actually grapple uh, with the, the stuff of scholarship and then can be inspired uh, as a result uh, of, of doing real scholarship. So a prime example of this is the Homer Multitext Project, uh, in which uh, students from several colleges and universities, including College of um, Holy Cross, um, University of Houston, Furman, and, and other institutions, uh, are, are sort of working on this project to understand the, the sort of textual history of Homeric manuscripts. Uh, so they're working with uh, high quality scanned images of these manuscripts. Uh, they're sort of uh, uh, transcribing them, connecting images uh, and, and the transcriptions, examining their features, and in the process, discovering how these manuscripts work, uh, developing insights into scribal culture. At Holy Cross, there's even a manuscripts club where students come together on like, Friday afternoons and, and work on these projects, and, and uh, they, they present their work in various contexts. So for faculty involved with this project, it is really um, satisfying to have students as collaborators on these projects. So, so one faculty member really talked about the relationships that develop as a result. And for students, it uh, is really satisfying to, to do real work that has a real impact in, in the world. Um, so uh, Greg Crane, who is one of the sort of leading digital classicists, actually points to the Homer Multitext Project as a prime example of you know, a really great digital humanities project. Not only because of the nature of the research, but because of how the research is conducted, the opportunity for students to, to make meaningful contributions to the development of knowledge. Another one of my favorite examples comes from Jeff McClurkin at the University of Mary Washington, who teaches a course with the really great title, Adventures in Digital History. And it really is constructed as an adventure in that students are challenged to work in teams to create some sort of digital project that uh, is connected to the local community. So, for example, they may work with the college archives to uh, uh, provide access to a collection of uh, audio interviews with a civil rights pioneer. Or in this case, to document historical markers in southeastern Virginia. So students do research on these different markers, um, citing their sources, using images, uh, but they also think about different ways to present this research, to, to locate the markers on a map and think about the sort of spatial components uh, of, of these historical events, uh, to locate them on a timeline, to think about different ways of categorizing them. Uh, and in the process, they're, they're challenged to develop technical skills as well as these sort of core research skills. So the mantra of the class, which I think is, is a great one, is be uncomfortable but not paralyzed. So students are kind of pushed to the edge. They're given a, a sort of introduction to different tools, but they kind of have to figure things out as they go as well, which initially can be terrifying, but I think by the end of the course, students have great pride in what they have been able to accomplish. So, Already, I think we're seeing elements of play uh, as well as sort of project-driven learning. Uh, but I'd like to point to ways in which a lot of digital pedagogy deliberately em employs elements of play, which of course is a prime way that we learn as, as children and hopefully as adults as well. Uh, so uh, one of uh, sort of uh, a, a digital humanities concept uh, is articulated by uh, Steve Ramsey, uh, who suggests that there's a scrumenutical imperative. And this gets to a point that was made earlier about the benefits of browsing and serendipity, that in, in, you know, we have to accept that we can't read it all. Uh, but instead, we can sort of browse and explore and make connections, which is actually kind of fundamental to the humanities, to, to interpret um, and to, to share what we've observed 
and, and uh, through that process to, to play with ideas. So one uh, approach to, to sort of promoting that sort of play uh, is this notion of not reading. Uh, and this was kind of articulated by, by Paul Fife uh, and uh, modified by Ryan Cordell at Northeastern University. And by the way, in digital humanities, there's kind of this culture of sharing teaching ideas. You'll see on syllabi, uh, instructors citing syllabi from other instructors, uh, kind of acknowledging that you know, there's, there's, there's sharing and borrowing going on and, and the exchange of ideas. But with, with this notion of not reading, this may be kind of shocking, you know, when, when it's drilled into you the importance of close reading in a literature class. But in, in, in this context, students are asked to pick a thick Victorian novel and not read it. So instead, to, to download the novel from, say, Project Gutenberg, and then to um, kind of predict what they think the novel might be about, uh, create word clouds, uh, where the most frequently used words are, are bigger and kind of look and see what's going on there and then take the analysis a, a level further and use a really great uh, environment for analyzing text called Voyant which allows you to create um, concordances and, and word lists where you see the most frequently used words you can compare how words are used you can see as this little graph shows where words are used most frequently across a text or across a corpus. Um, and, and based on that, students are challenged to sort of ruminate, like, okay, what does this mean? What does it mean that Dickens uses language of the body a lot in this novel? And then to, to write a sort of paper, a, a lab report, uh, reflecting on what they've learned. And the point here is to get students to think about how they ask questions. Uh, and how they kind of form opinions based upon uh, the, the act of interpretation. It's, it's deliberately playful. And it, it, it's another one of those uh, kinds of assignments that can be a little shocking, but also can, can sort of <coughs> stimulate uh, play and um, new insights into what it means to, to interpret and, and how we read literature. So Alan Liu teaches a course called Literature Plus, um, where students are also exposed to these different modes of reading, different tools for thinking about literature. And um, his, one of his goals is to kind of set up a, a studio-like environment where students work together to explore literary text uh, and collaborate um, and, and kind of learn together. So it's another example of a project-driven course, where the first half or so of the course is devoted to exploring different techniques for literary analysis, and the second half is, is really focused on project work. So the way the projects work is that um, there, there are teams that explore different methods, text analysis, as was shown in, in that previous example, or, or mapping, or deformance, this notion that uh, you can like, read a text backward or uh, you know, uh, play with, with the, the, the nature of the text. Uh, so students have to produce uh, a prototype as well as reflections on the work that they do. And I think there's this crucial dynamic between play and reflection. Uh, so some examples of the different kinds of projects that have been produced Canterbury blogs, so converting the Canterbury Tales into blogs where each character has their own blog and you kind of see in, in contemporary vernacular uh, these stories unfold. Or a project to, to map a novel about the immigrant experience and see the different paths that characters in the novel navigate. Or to convert um, a Shakespearean sonnet into to sound and rhythm and to use sound and rhythm to understand the patterns in the sonnet. Um, so, so disorienting, but uh, in, a, in a kind of commonly used phrase in digital humanities, productive disorientation. Another example of a student project that, that actually uses the word uh, that, that we associate with, with sort of play, uh, ludic analytics, uh, brought together three students to contemplate what it means to use visualization tools and whether you could have a pretty versus a useful visualization. 
So this is a visualization, for example, of the edit history in Wikipedia, uh, to, to bring that example up again. Um, in the Spanish and English versions of a, 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 a pages on a Mexican novelist. Uh, and the students involved in this project um, really kind of thought in new ways about how we use visualization to understand data, uh, the, both the, the sort of um, possibilities and, and perils of, of this approach. So, um, I, I mean, I think there's a lot to be gained through play. And the final area I want to look at is the, the social components of learning. Uh, so Randy Bass and uh, Heidi Elmendorf uh, have this, this interesting framework of sort of social pedagogies. At its core, uh, it's about producing sort of authentic um, representations of learning um, for an, a, a real audience uh, and, and participating in a community in the process of developing these, these sort of uh, learning products. So uh, some examples of uh, ways in which we can put, embrace the social side of learning uh, include the Praxis program uh, at the University of Virginia, where I did my, my graduate work. This is a program that brings together six graduate fellows to, in the course of a year, develop uh, a humanistic tool, a tool to aid in interpretation. It doesn't, it's not a formal course, it's more of a sort of mentorship and a, a project that, that's driven by teamwork. Uh, students not only learn about the sort of fundamentals of software development, but consciously think about collaboration in the process of uh, creating a, a group charter, for example. They learn about project management, they learn about how to present their work in public. And um, the project that uh, the current uh, cohort is working on, as well as the one preceding it, is another example of sort of invoking the spirit of play. Uh, so this uh, uses what's called the Ivanhoe game, which got started actually um, in the early 2000s at UVA when um, a few faculty and graduate students uh, wanted to sort of reimagine re uh, Sir Walter Scott's novel Ivanhoe and took on different roles and sort of rewriting, reimagining the novel. So, so the Ivanhoe game uh, as sort of uh, developed by the Praxis uh, program is a WordPress plugin that allows for the playing of the game, to, assuming different roles. Um, in, in this example, it's a suffragette game, uh, which uh, allows a sort of counter history of the suffragette movement in, um, in early 20th century England to emerge. Um, but it, it's, again, a, a sort of um, the, the act of developing this itself uh, allows students to develop ways of thinking about collaboration and, and, and being pushed to learn these new skills. Uh, and the game itself uh, really makes possible a sort of playful approach to thinking about literature and history. Another uh, example of a sort of social approach to uh, learning that um, is um, helped along through digital uh, technologies is the Looking for Whitman project. Uh, now, Whitman, the poet of democracy, um, is taught around the world, but in classrooms that are kind of contained. So the, the, the point of uh, the Whitman project is to sort of dissolve those barriers. This brought together four different classes at the University of Mary Washington in Northern Virginia, the City College of New York, uh, Rutgers University Camden, three locations important to the life of Whitman, plus a university in Serbia and using um, a sort of social networking extension of WordPress. Um, this allowed the different classes to kind of see what uh, students in other classes were doing. They had some common assignments, like producing their own frontispieces to Leaves of Grass, um, and could sort of comment on, on those different uh, projects, feel a sense of being part of a larger classroom community, um, so it was, as, as Jim Broom says, an experiment in multi-campus pedagogy. And, and at the end of the course, uh, those in the United States were able to come together to explore Whitman's house in Camden um, and, and sort of had this, this classroom community already partially formed. But it brought together students from four different, very, very different types of institutions for this common learning experience. 
So we're, we're running a little bit short on time, so I'll, I'll save the questions for uh, the discussion period. Um, and I did want to point to, to a few challenges uh, that are involved in, in digital pedagogy. And I'm sure you're probably thinking of others. Uh, and, and these include, like, how do you bring these methods into the, the curriculum? How do you help students develop technology skills? How do you evaluate work when we don't really have established rubrics necessarily for, for looking at these different kinds of work? So in terms of, of the curricular question, um, I mean, I would suggest not trying to do it all, starting small with a specific project that's driven by a specific learning objective, whether that be uh, you know, as, uh, taking part in a public dialogue and, and learning how to address a public audience or thinking in new ways about how we read. Um, you can um, use existing platforms. Uh, for example, there's a, a platform called History Engine in which students can write brief histories, often uh, drawing from local archival materials, and locate these histories on a map and a timeline, contribute them to a larger collection, also authored by students. And I, I would, as a librarian myself, uh, advocate for partnering with uh, local archives and museums, uh, if possible, um, for, for sort of rich opportunities for students to work with cultural materials. In terms of developing technology skills, um, one strategy is to sort of understand where students are by surveying them at the beginning of the semester to see what kinds of skills they have. And the, that survey can inform the construction of groups, for example. Uh, students can also mentor each other, those who have more sophisticated skills. And there, there's great uh, stuff on the, the sort of network. For example, there's a resource called Digital Humanities Questions and Answers where people pose questions about pedagogy and share ideas. There's, as I said, there's this culture of sharing in the digital humanities. In terms of evaluation, uh, a strategy that Jeff McClurkin uses uh, that um, has had success is, is having student contracts where uh, at the beginning of projects, students articulate what it is they're going to do, how they're going to do it, when they're going to do it, who's going to do what, uh, and then you have check-in points to make sure things are proceeding as expected with the project. And students are also responsible for writing sort of individual reflections on what they've learned, what they've done. Again, this, this interplay between doing and, and reflecting. Um, another strategy I've found to be um, useful is to have authentic assessment measures. So in my graduate digital humanities course um, last, in the fall of 2014, Students wrote uh, grant proposals and teams uh, using the digital humanities startup grants as a, the sort of um, the, the, the initial prompt. And the, um, the uh, proposals were evaluated in part based upon the criteria laid out by the grant program. So, well, again, we'll get to some questions in, in just a minute. Um, but I wanted to kind of bring things together by presenting some student perspectives on these approaches. So a student um, in Alan Liu's course who focused on the Ludic Analytics Project talked about the ways in which the, the class really uh, took her work in new directions, allowed her to mutate, a word I really like, uh, and, and energized her own scholarly work. And a student in Jeff McClurkin's digital history class Likewise, talked about the excitement of participating in the act of doing, you know, real scholarship and, and learning in this experiential way. So, to kind of bring things back together and reinforce these themes I've been uh, focusing on throughout the, the talk, uh, I think there are real possibilities for digital humanities learning and, and providing authentic opportunities for, for, for learning, for having a public impact for learning together, uh, for uh, you know, taking risk, and as a result of taking those risks, developing new confidence, uh, and for <coughs> developing a critical understanding of how different tools work, how we work with digital resources. So with that, I want to acknowledge a lot of different mater materials I uh, drew upon in this talk, and I invite your questions and comments. Um, I I'm interested in, in you know, what you think about the, the possibilities for digital approaches and what, what kind of qualms you might have. So let's, let's hear from, from you all. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just thought this was really inspirational. So many terrific ideas that I really want to absorb. 
Uh huh. Uh, one reaction that I was having when you were talking about the uh, the uh, like beginning of the voyant uh -huh, you know, yeah. methodology and all, and kind of looking at the shape of the words and how they try to get sense across time or across the book. Uh -huh. It seems to me what the reaction I was having was now how great to do that to start the students out in getting a feel for the way the language works, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but then to actually delve then with those expectations into the real deep reading of the book. Right. You know, it wouldn't be enough to just look at how the word, how does the word chart shape itself, mm -hmm. and all these other fascinating things you can find, but then see, in fact, reflect, as you said, you know, upon what, how that translates into how the author put the words on the page and, and how we as readers react in, in traditional ways and in non-traditional ways. Exactly, yeah, and one thing that Boyant does allow you to do is actually go into the text itself to see the word used in context. But, but it also can be a prompt for going to the physical novel or whatever text you're looking at and, and thinking more about how that pattern plays out. So yeah, it, can't, it, it doesn't just have to be used for not reading, it can inspire a deeper reading. Yes. I think that, that question just kind of makes me think about some of the kind of broader issues with this is how to use this to add instead of subtract or replace uh -huh. what we're doing in the classroom. I think we often just feel like we have a lot that we have to accomplish in a little time. Mm -hmm. That to go in these projects is often that we're sacrificing something else. And I, I think that's a really interesting way to, to, to you know, to not have this, the, the word exercise instead of the reading, but as a way to structure these assignments, these exercises, to deepen, mm -hmm. to add, right, right. To, to the to comprehension, to students' understanding, and to build skills. And I think that, I mean, if I were designing, I would just, that's it's maybe helped me clarify that, that I would want to think about it in those terms. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we do make choices in terms of what we can include in a course. So I would like to think of this as an additive. Um, but I mean, I, I would suggest, you know, think again about the learning objectives uh, before jettisoning something. something. But, but also it may be that these approaches will help you to advance certain objectives and maybe a little content has to be sacrificed to make room for that. Yeah. I noticed a lot of your um, examples, were they all graduate students? What is the level of appropriateness? Because we, we've all had students that just, you know, we need innovative approaches to get through to that particular student. For instance, in your project-based one where you said, uh, I think the quote was, but don't paralyze them. Uh-huh. That was uh, an undergraduate course. Yeah, now I teach visual communication, so, you know, I always use the example, you know, when I was in my undergraduate work, there was not these digital tools. And now, for instance, we have an Adobe Cloud Lab. and beautiful uh, generated community presentations and work that the student, if they just get in the saddle and, man, they could really self-teach quite easily. But I often get a pushback of like some students that were like, well, no, I'm paying for you to sit here and feed it to me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so as millennial as we, we claim these young university students to be, there really are some who, who feel somehow cheated if they have to independently pursue that and, and coming from fine arts and where everything is project based and, and exploration and play and discovery, um, moving into more of a liberal art context um, for visual comm, I often, I wondered if you had had experience in that kind of student. Yeah, I mean, I was actually just at a teaching workshop at Rice <laughs> last week where that was a large part of the, the conversation about, um, yeah, students reluctant sometimes to actually, you know, uh, be challenged to do this work rather than have it, the knowledge sort of dumped in. And I'm curious what students here think about that. Uh, yeah. Trick us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have lots of tricks. Yeah. Like trick us into playing the game. If, if we don't, if we don't, like, like you said, we cross our arms like, no, I don't want to play. If, yeah. you, if you ask a question that then gets us thinking about what it is that you want us to think about without us, because unfortunately, teacher, the teacher-student relationship is inherently adversarial in many ways, especially when we are being as stringently assessed as we are. So if we can, if you can essentially trick us into playing a game, well, then it makes it much easier for us to get on board, as it were, and uncross our arms and start thinking about the thing. Unification is 
it's also on my plate. So. Yeah. <laughs> Gamify it and it'll Gamify work. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, yeah. So that's what I often feel that, you know, these resources are so robust and amazing, but not every student feels the value yet in, in approaching that. That's a great advice. Thank you. Yeah, and I think also just explain why you're doing things the way you are. That it's really because it's a like short of time. Uh -huh. you know, it's that short of time that don't explain it. Don't explain it. Because, <laughs> if, because if you if you does that give away the game? If you if you tell if you say that there is a man behind the curtain, then they will be less impressed by Oz. You know what I mean? Like so, if if they're not if 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 you if you tell them that this is what you're trying to do, then they will start looking for tricks. It's uh, shortcut. Yeah. Shortcuts and shortcuts. Yes. Exactly. So, I'm done. I'm not talking to you. Yeah. So, um, the one thing about it is, how much, like, computer power do you need to do one of these? Like, is it, are the the mechanisms for doing digital humanities products ones that you can say, you know? Students, you can do this in the privacy of your own laptop, or does a good digital product need to be something that, need, that has a computer lab? It's comparatively expensive software, or pioneer software, or is there kind of like a series? Like, are there like you know, cheap, low, um, for lack of a better word, low tech options that you can use that that doesn't that yeah. will let you? I can answer that. I know last week it was the 150th anniversary of the Lincoln assassination. And there was people real time tweeting the events of the assassination. That's something in social media could be used to create a small digital project. Yeah, I mean, so there are a lot of there are a lot of free software products that you can use. I mean, I, I am conscious of sort of the potential digital divide issues. If not all students have access to a computer, that could be a problem. Uh, but there are a lot of web-based or, or free um, software products that can be used to do a lot of this work. Mm -hmm. I guess it depends on the project you have to. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so for visual in communications, my case, that might be industry a challenge. Standards, yeah. that's the tools you would use. But but I, I often give them alternatives if they can't. Right. And like now so students can get Adobe for $20 a month, so yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like it. Mm -hmm. But, but they still, if you don't have a computer, but if you don't have a computer to start with, the subscription means nothing. So our labs are still very, very important. You get a delete for twenty dollars. If you have your good computer, yeah. Sick. Yeah. <laughs> faculty too. <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> Any other faculty tips? <laughs> Student tips? We're we're generating all sorts of good stuff. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say that I personally enjoyed the discussion. Dr. Ardwan here is going to be teaching a course in Introduction to Digital Humanities in the fall. And um, hopefully in 2016 we're going to have a certificate at UTSA um, like the UCLA one. And hopefully every program in Colfax will we'll find at least one or two classes a semester that have digital content. So, so we'll find other ones like yourselves. <laughs> so we have a reason to grow it. Yes. <laughs> and if there's things you want, um, find us. Well, at least I will listen, and I'm writing a report, so. Intro. Doctor Arvon. That's an undergraduate course. But there are going to be faculty-based events. Some um, Doctor Adair here has been teaching us all about text, uh, TEI encoding, and proper practices for making literary materials manipulable by the internet. We're going to have grant writing. We had a grant writing workshop and. Uh, March that we had about 25 people coming to a group that with a more specifically digital focus, and every semester we're going to have at least uh, every year we have we should have at least one faculty workshop on digital tools. It would be interesting to do a collaborative thing of student and faculty where you're bringing in other colleges, graphic designers maybe, and humanity classicists, and I mean that because maybe we could create a, a unique UTSA tool, and you know. OIT does um, monthly things where like, they bring in professors who have done, so it's a 
my Google Maps project, uh, Dr. Matthias in here, it was Point Matthias, and his wiki project, mm -hmm. um, the, the graphics work that Dr. Dr. Madden does. So um, we're trying to do both sides of that picture and these are progressing more open you know, to all sets, but I'm now interrupting Dr. Spiro. But no, that's fine. The future, you know, <laughs> the future is exciting and apparently also forsaken because that's what that. Um, and you had said something about public. Um, um, for some of us that went to the um, uh, humanities grant kind of um, function as well, um, the thing about public works, about using digital tools to, to educate and inform more massive lay audiences of some of this stuff, I think is a real interesting intersect of public and academy um, sharing of knowledge, <laughs> which I'm real excited about digital humanities for. Yeah, that excites me too. <laughs> the public, you know, be, you know, again, making it where it's accessible to, well, potentially, obviously, the globe, but but, mm -hmm. but certainly communities that don't have libraries, communities that don't have you know, internet, even, but even things that can be broadcast or shared or you know, things like that, I think, are what's valuable mm -hmm. in the public education. Yeah, yeah, further demonstrates the value of the humanities. Mm -hmm. so, anything else? Well, thanks for the great discussion. Thank you for being and, uh, here. Yeah, thank much you. Thank 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 you.